Well, we've never had this many people. Even when we have Christmas starting. open houses, we don't get this many. <laughs> no, 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 no. Thank you, uh, everyone, for coming and uh, on short notice, and uh, thank you for leaving me alone last night. As you know, last night I notified the Board of Directors of the Edmonton St. Albert Conservative Association and also notified the Speaker of my intent. What is a very difficult decision, and that is that I'm resigning the Conservative Caucus to sit as an independent in the House of Commons for the duration of the 41st Parliament. Clearly, the government's decision not to support my private member's bill, C-461, on CBC and public sector disclosure yesterday in committee was the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. However, this decision and my comfort level within the caucus has been evolving for at least a year when some of you will recall that I published my a blog on ministerial opulence entitled Of Orange Juice and Limos. I've re reluctantly come to the inescapable conclusion that the government's lack of support for my transparency bill is tantamount to a lack of support for transparency and open government generally. The government chose to gut my bill despite not a single witness testifying at the Access Committee in support of their eviscerating amendments, which would have raised, which will raise the bar for salary disclosure, disclosure for federal, sub, um, federal public servants from my proposal of $188,000 to $444,000 and capture very, very few um, civil servants, save for a few CEOs of some crown corporations. I was disappointed in the government's position. I was disappointed that all of the evidence that was adduced at the committee was ignored, and mostly I was I am concerned and disappointed that the decision appears to have been made in advance before the committees even commenced. I will use my now unchained opportunity in question period to ask the government pointed but fair questions on principles I believe in and that I believe most conservatives believe in but seem to have been abandoned or at least compromised by this government in the name of political expediency. Return to balanced budgets, limiting the size and scope of government, the aforementioned open and accountable tra transpar transparent operation of government, belief in markets, and eliminating corporate subsidies are all matters of importance to my constituents, but to one extent or another have been sacrificed at the altar of electoral calculation. Uh, I'll take any and all questions, but hopefully we can do this in some sort of orderly fashion. You mentioned on your blog that uh, you had some concern with uh, the control with the PMO, and how that might alert to some of this, the Senate spending scandals. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I've always been concerned about a lack of separation between the legislative and executive branches of government. And we see it uh, frequently. We saw it yesterday. We saw it where the legislative members of the committee were uh, basically dictated by political staffers how they were going to vote. I mean, I know that there was widespread support for my bill, but the government, for its own reason, for its own political reason, decided that they weren't going to support the bill and disclose salaries above $188,000. So the conservative members on the committee and the majority were, were um, dictated or, or told how to vote. And I think that's inappropriate. I think that's a lack of respect for the legislative process. The members of that committee are duly elected by their constituents uh, to, to represent them and appointed uh, by the various parties to sit on that committee. And they ought to be able to hear the evidence, hear the arguments, and make a decision based on what they think is best for Canada, what they think is best for the constituents, not be told how to vote by uh, unelected staffers at Langevin Block. The, the, Prime Prime Minister's office said you the Prime Minister's office says you should resign your seat and there should be a by-election. What's your response to that? Well, I think that's a little rich coming from the Prime Minister's office. You will recall, and I, I think with the, benef with the benefit of hindsight, they may actually realize the hole in that argument, and I think it shows a lack of understanding of how our, our West Westminster Parliament works. I mean, the Conservative Party doesn't own this seat simply because I won it for them in, in the last election. That, this is not the electoral college in, in the United States where uh, a person is sent there to, to represent the party that, that was voted. I am a, I'm a member of Parliament. Um, and I, I guess I have two other words, and that's David Emerson. Um, you will recall that in 2006, and my election was two and a half years ago, uh, but David Emerson, having just been elected days before as a Liberal, walked across the floor and joined the Conservative government. So I don't think that they have any authority to, to, to make that um, type of suggestion. That being said, and I'll provide a caveat, I mean, 
I'm accountable to my, my uh, constituents, and if I sense that my constituents are unhappy with the decision, then I'll have to deal with it. But the preliminary uh, emails and tweets that have come into this office would show anything but unhappiness. So uh, I suspect I'm safe with my constituents, and I'll answer to them. I won't answer to PMO anymore. What's changed in your party in the okay. last two and a half years? You were talking about electoral calculations and sacrificing certain things. What do you think has changed? Well, I think, I mean, I this is my second term, and in the first term it was a minority parliament, and it was explained and, and I think bought into by most of the caucus that there had to be control of messaging so that we could get to the promised land, the majority government. But once we got to the majority government, then members like Mark Warwa or myself still still were not free to speak on issues that were important to us. And now the uh, the buzzword is, well, we have to maintain our majority government, so we still have to have control, mes control messaging. So so the, the the government is intent on uh, on keeping members on script online. I don't fit well into that into that model. I like to represent my constituents. I like to speak up um, and on matters that that I, I believe need to be spoken up on. And uh, so I don't really fit too well in the PMO's model of what is a, a model backbencher, and that is to read the talking points and stay on script. Yeah, what did the Riding Association say when you told them? Um, I think they were very, very surprised and uh, quite shocked, uh, but I, I understand that uh, uh, they're very, very supportive and I encourage them to carry on. I think it's important that they carry on as an electoral association. There's a convention coming up at the, at the end of the month. I know they're sending delegates. There's going to be important policy uh, uh, resolutions being debated there and I, th I think they need to carry on. Have Will you spoken to the Prime Minister? Lobby no. for St. Albert? Will this change how you can advocate for St. Albert and what do you have to say to your constituents? Well, as an independent member of parliament, I no longer have to vote the party line. I no longer have to uh, vote in a direction that the party whip directs me to. Um, as an independent, I mean, I can assess the issue, I can assess the bill on its merits and, and, make, and make a decision. Where I've always maintained this, in fact, the Reform Party used to preach this, that you elect a member to represent the constituents in Ottawa, not represent Ottawa to the constituents. Well, when you have a PMO that tightly scripts its backbenches, like this one attempts to do, MPs don't represent their constituents in Ottawa, they represent the government to their constituents. Are there, are there MPs the feeling the same way as you? You mentioned Mark Warwa. Are there, do you think this is the beginning of something I, I have no idea. I am not uh, recruiting. I am not trying to break up the government. I'm not trying to break up the party. I'm doing what's best for me and what's best for my constituents, and that is to uh, resign from from a caucus so that I can speak freely on issues. Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm very disappointed that they got in my bill yesterday. And I'm, I'm v generally very uh, disappointed in their um, record with respect to transparency and accountability. Uh, generally, as uh, the Duffy. Right uh, matter uh, shows some difficulties with respect to how, how they've handled that file. Do you believe the Prime Minister didn't know that well? Mr. Wright wrote that text? Do you plan Sorry, to Peter? resign from the party as well? Sorry? Do you plan to resign from the party as well? Hmm, I never even thought of that. Um, I suspect that sometime they might revoke my membership. I may not have to. So you said it was a long time. What did you want to know about the deal between Duffy and Wright? What more do you think has the Canadians should know about what happened? Well, I think Canadians should know what the, what the quid pro quo was. I mean, I, 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 yeah, and Dan sort of asked these questions. Yes, I absolutely take the Prime Minister on his word that he did not know. And that sounds uh, like an exoneration and it is to him and his honor and, and to his truthfulness but I think it actually creates a much bigger problem and that is that the Prime Minister's office seems to be accountable to nobody not even the Prime Minister that a decision of that magnitude could have been made and executed without even without even informing the Prime Minister I think that creates a problem um, I think Canadians want to know what was the quid pro quo what as a legislator as a member of Parliament I do not want to be beholden or indebted to the executive branch of government. How does that allow me to independently vet government legislation? So I don't know what the quid pro, pro, pro quo was between uh, the former chief of staff to the prime minister and uh, Senator Duffy, but um, I think Canadians have a right to know. And I, and, I, and I think it's very inappropriate. I think it's inappropriate at so many levels that the chief of staff to the prime minister would uh, offer a gift to, to, to try to make a, uh, an expense issue go away. Will you run in the next election and if so under which banner? Uh, I don't know. Um, I am m most mindful of the you know, or the difficulty in getting elected as an independent. Uh, the resources that parties are able to throw at an election uh, makes running under a, a party banner 
almost an imperative, but not quite an imperative. Um, two, and a half is, two and a half years is a long time, so I'll have to assess the political landscape um, sometime in 2015 to determine whether or not it's realistic that, a, that an independent might have a shot at, uh, at uh, retaining the seat. Would you ever Even, consider running for an, under another party's banner? No. Even with well, the positive response to you? Even with the positive response? I mean, you, you, should never, you should never say never, but uh, highly unlikely. You also said in your blog that it was an inescapable, you just said, sorry, it's an ines it was an inescapable decision. Why inescapable? Well, this is an inescapable conclusion that the government's lack of support for my b bill was uh, symptomatic of a lack of support for transparency and accountability generally. I think in light of everything that's gone on uh, with respect to the problems with the senators and their expenses and how the government has tried to, to handle those files, um, quite frankly, a bill called the, the CBC and Public Sector Disclosure and Transparency Act, I would have thought was a lifeline. I would have thought that the, that the government would have embraced this as, as showing a commitment to transparency. But for their own political reasons and for their own, uh, I think, fear of, of disclosing what some of the salaries of the top bureaucrats really are, uh, they did what they did yesterday. Why not fight from within? About... Why not fight from within? Why, why do you think the only way you can fight now is from outside the caucus? Well, it's. I mean, there, there's a, there's a number of, of questions there, but it, but it comes down to my ability to to maintain the respect of my constituents, and I mean, as the government, as it's my observation, and I think my inescapable conclusion, to use your words, of using my words, that the government's uh, lack of commitment to transparency and accountability is very very troubling, and um, I can't unequivocally, as a result, I can't unequivocally support the government anymore. I said in my blog. And I mean that I will support the government on a case-by-case, issue-by-issue basis. If I believe a legislative initiative um, w w would benefit Edmonton, St. Albert, and benefit Alberta, I'll support it. If I think it it won't, then I won't. So um, it, it's a matter of doing what's best for my constituents. What does it mean personally for your salary and for your budget for research and whatnot? Nothing. How much support do you have for the prime minister if you left his, his caucus? Sorry? How much support do you actually have for the Prime Minister if you have actually left his caucus? I support the Prime Minister. I respect the Prime Minister. I think he has been uh, a, a very great leader for uh, the party and, and for the country. Um, I sometimes question the decisions of those who work for him and under him. I think I've been very clear on that. Uh, but I still I still have great respect for him as an individual and, and as for a Prime Minister. And as I said, um, I, I will continue to support the government, but no longer unconditionally. How can you reconcile the fact that you're saying you respect the Prime Minister, but you're saying you don't even recognize your party anymore and the party can't even recognize itself? How do you reconcile those two things if he is the leader? Well, the party is bigger than the Prime Minister. He is the leader. Um, and I think we can all acknowledge that the, the party ha has had some problems in the last few weeks and the last few months. Um, that being said, um, I, still have, I, still, I still have a great respect for the Prime Minister, both as a man and, and as a leader and a, as a Prime Minister. Brent, this isn't the first time you've been in opposition to a government in which you've sat. Was this perhaps inevitable in some way? Well, I'll lead you. To, I'll let you come to that conclusion. I, I mean, I think I think what's consistent from my days at the Alberta Legislature is that I put principle before party. I try to represent my constituents to the best of my ability before party, um, and I, I think at the end of the day, my constituents respect me for, for taking that stand. Have Even you had with any the contact with the response you've had so far from constituents? Uh, don't you think the right thing to do would be to hold a by-election and just see where everything shakes out with everybody? Well, as I indicated, um, that suggestion, I, I think, shows a lack of understanding of how our Westminster model of parliament works. The party doesn't own this seat. This is not the electoral college in the U.S. Um, there is no precedent for that happening. In fact, in the last parliament, there was an NDP private members bill that would have uh, indicated that if an individual wanted to resign his, his party affiliation and for sure if he was going to walk across the floor and join another party, but I think also if he was going to sit in it as an independent, he was going to uh, have to, to submit to a, a by-election. The government voted against it. If the PMO's office is uh, suggesting that you should run in a by-election and you're alleging that decisions are coming from that office by extension, or do you think that none of this is happening without the Prime Minister's knowledge? Uh, do you think that by extension he has some 
some say in some of these things? I mean, I have no idea how the internal workings of, of the Prime Minister's office works. I'm sure he has been briefed on uh, that I resigned from the caucus and that we're having this, this press conference this morning. Um, I don't believe, with all that he has on his plate, I don't believe that he micromanages these types of files. What did you, did you or will he do anything to get you back, do you think? Uh, you'd, have to, you'd have to ask PMO. Would you consider going back to the Conservative Party if there were changes? Well, uh, uh, joining other parties, going back to the party, I've only resigned from the Conservative Party about 12 hours ago. So um, I, I, I can't rule anything unequivocally out. I can only tell you that it is my intention to sit as an independent for the duration of the 41st Parliament. If something changes, um, I may have to reevaluate that decision, but that is my that is my intent as of this moment. Have any Alberta Tory MPs contacted you? What have they said? No. What about your co uh, caucus colleagues? Yes, I have received um, um, a couple dozen emails from caucus, former caucus colleagues uh, indicating support and disappointment, but understanding the decision and, and also some uh, concern about how the bill was handled yesterday in committee. How firm do you think the Prime Minister's support is in caucus? I know that you're the, you made this decision by yourself and didn't say that you're bringing a whole bunch of people with you, but given that you've made this decision, how much control does the Prime Minister have in his caucus now? I, I think the Prime Minister has virtually complete control over that caucus. The caucus is very different to the will of the Prime Minister. And is that a good or bad thing? Um, for me, it's a bad thing. And so what, what efforts, if any, did you make to, to meet with Prime Minister Harper in the recent weeks to discuss your bill or con these kinds of concerns? Um, well, I met in the drafting of this bill, and, and this was a long, drawn-out process, and there were at least, I think, six versions of this bill before we finally tabled a version uh, setting the benchmark at $188,000. Um, I met with senior level of the civil service. I met with senior lawyers at the Justice Department. They have carriage of the Access to Information Act and the Privacy Act. And I met with the, the Prime Minister's senior policy advisor. So I've, I've not met with the Prime Minister, but I've met a number of times with his senior policy advisor. So how, how could the Prime Minister, who has how? no control over his, has complete control over his caucus, but he's become manipulated by his PMO. That's on its face, that's a bit, sort of counterproductive, isn't it? Well, I think, I mean, it's always the media that, that writes that he's, you know, such a micromanager. I'm not convinced that those legends are entirely true. I mean, I think an operation as big and as uh, expansive as, as the government of Canada, um, obviously a lot of delegated authority is given. And I, I think, you know, given the, the right Duffy affair, I think perhaps maybe too much delegated authority. Certainly, certainly I am shocked that that decision was made by the chief of staff without um, advising the Prime Minister. I, I believe that's the way, I believe that's how it went down, but I'm shocked that it could go down that way. How aware were you that your bill would be, you know, as you call it, gutted? Oh, I knew. How long? Oh, I knew. I, I knew back in uh, late uh, January, early February, before the bill had even gone to second reading. And in fact, if you read the debate at second reading, the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice uh, advises the House that the government supports the bill in principle, but it's going to propose amendments at committee. So I've known since... Uh, late January, early February, that it was the government's intent to protect its highest paid civil servants. Um, and of course, that's what I find so frustrating. We have, uh, the bill goes, passes a second reading, goes to committee. There are five uh, two-hour committee meetings scheduled to, to vet this bill. Witnesses are called to testify. Uh, not a single witness supports the proposition that 188,000 is too low. In fact, the Taxpayers Federation and the National Citizens Coalition testified that that it was too low, too high, and should have been lowered to 200,000 to match Ontario's sunshine list. But in the absence of any evidence, um, the government introduces an amendment uh, moving the salary disclosure bar to make sure that no deputy minister is is. Um, covered by it. So I find that process very, very troubling because it was pointless. Um, I think I called it a shroud in my in my blog today. The decision had been made well before the, com the hearings to vet this bill had ever commenced. So when was your decision made then to, to resign from caucus based on the gutting of this bill? Well, um, I think it has been coming for some time. I've been frustrated and disappointed for some time. 
and I, I guess I made a final decision that I would hang in there long enough to try to get caucus support on that committee to break rank with the directions of the PMO and support my bill unamended. I knew that that was a long shot. I knew that I was pushing a rock uphill and it didn't happen. So that was sort of the last reason for me to stay in the caucus was uh, my faint hope that I might be able to convince the Conservatives on the caucus to actually protect, protect the bill and, and give taxpayers the, the legislation that they want. And why did you decide to announce it on Twitter? Um, I think it was effective. Um, I mean, it was a timing matter. My, my board met, met last night. It was a regularly scheduled meeting. They, they meet the first Wednesday of the month, so I wanted to tell them first. And then after I advised, told them, it was about 10 o'clock Ottawa time, um, then I advised the Speaker and the Prime Minister's office and the Chief Government Whip, and then I put it on Twitter in that order. So then in your opinion, then, if the PMO's office is not transparent and, uh, you know, they, they are essentially making decisions as far as what you're saying, who is the person or the group of people, in your opinion, who would crack down on that? And who would they be accountable to? Well, I think legislators uh, like myself have to take a stand. We have to take a stand that we're not going to read these talking points that are written by PMO staffers, that we're not going to vote uh, at, like train seals based on how they tell us, and not just in the House, also in committee, as we saw what happened yesterday. It's up to legislators. I mean, in my view, power is never ever grabbed power is voluntarily ceded and so too many uh, backbench MPs do willingly what the Prime Minister's office wants them to do because they see that as a way of, of advancement within the party and, with, and within, within the government. But that's led to some problems and, and we're seeing the evidence of that now and I, I do believe that the PMO um, has too much power, that they uh, ha don't properly respect the legislatures and most importantly that there's not a proper degree of separation between the legislature and the executive. If the legislature, and that's both houses, both the House of Commons and the Senate, if, if they are to provide some sort of check on the government, there has to be a healthy degree of separation and this deal between uh, the former Chief of Staff and Senator Duffy, I think is evidence that there is virtually no separation. Your Brent, blog suggested Brent, that you took Brent, a, this took a personal toll. Mm -hmm. You're making a real distinction between the PMO and the Prime Minister who you say you respect. Can you tell us more about that? Well, it's just very, it's very simple, Janet. I, I think that a lot of stuff goes on in the PMO that the Prime Minister doesn't know about. I mean, we know that. He, we know that he did not know about the check. And I don't think that's the only example. Well, your, your blog suggests that this has taken that? a personal toll. What do you mean by that? Well, it's difficult. It's difficult as a, as a, a lawyer and as a member of parliament to, uh, to find my role being to be, you know, subservient to um, masters half my age at the Prime Minister's office who, who tell me how to vote on matters, who tell me uh, what questions to ask of witnesses in committee, who uh, vet my SO31s or my, or my one minute member statements and that was a big story just before Easter with Mr. Warwa. So it's uh, personally difficult, it becomes personally challenging to, uh, to be a, a, a free thinking, I would like to think of myself as a semi-intelligent individual, but uh, to, to constantly be directed by unelected staffers about half my age. Forgive me, I'm having a hard time understanding how you can make the separation between the PMO's office and the Prime Minister. Do you mind explaining that? Well, it's a little not, bit more. It's not complicated. The Prime Minister's office is a large entity. It has over 100 employees. Mm -hmm. um, and as in any bureaucratic structure that big, nobody can know what every part of that operation is up to at any given time. But who's in charge? The Prime Minister's in charge. It's his, it's his department. Right. So, that, so that's why, I mean, so I think the opposition is, is quite right. I mean, it's up to the Prime Minister to answer the questions in the House as to the specific details between between Senator Duffy and, and the former Chief of Staff because under our th concept of responsible government, the, the Minister is responsible for his department and that's the Prime Minister's department. You really made a reference you mean, to something about you, you don't think there's another example or oh, you, you were saying that there, you don't think that's the only example. Could you expand on that? I'm you said that just a check. moment ago with regards to check, the check between Wright and Duffy? 
Oh, well, just uh, the interference within the legislative process. What happened to Mark Warwa and what happened to me yesterday is when um, the Warwa situation was when he had, he had a, a motion uh, to condemn abortion based on the gender of the fetus. And uh, the evidence at the Votability Committee was that it was entirely votable. It met all the rules to be debated and voted on in the House of Commons. But the, the instructions given to the members of that committee were to vote nay, notwithstanding that there was no evidence to vote anything but yay. And the same thing happened to me yesterday. I mean, there was no evidence that the salary disclosure bar for civil servants should be anything other than 188, unless the T Taxpayers Federation said it's 100. But the members of the committee had their instructions, and uh, that was pretty much game over. Can you we're going to we're gonna have to we're gonna have to end this at 11:30. One quick question about your blog: um, What do you mean by the party has morphed into what it once mocked? Well, um, the Liberal Party was plagued by a reputation as being um, scandalous and endured a very, very difficult time. In, no doubt you recall the sponsorship scandal. And Conservatives and Reformers used to mock that. And now the, the, and it's, it's a difference of uh, degree, but perhaps not a difference of kind, that now the Conservative brand is wearing some of the same allegations. And we have, you know, senators who are claiming, who are being very liberal on their expense accounts and making ineligible expense claims. So, um, and to some extent, to some extent, uh, the party apparatus is defending that, or at least trying to deflect it by pointing out um, other situations where people have la acted less than ethically, acted less than ethically. So I, I fear, when we, when we start justifying and rationalizing that kind of behavior, I fear we're morphing into what we once mocked.